All right. Okay. So this person, this Persian artist, um, reminds me, must have been influenced. Um, do you remember Basquiat? He's him? not Persian, is he? No, no, but his, you can tell right. because of the, to this, this Persian artist seems to me. Have been oh, yeah. By him. Do you remember Basquiat? Yeah. He, he was from New York, Jamaican descent, uh, a child pro a prodigy. You know, he was some uh, street graffiti and sort of then did, in New York City did paintings, did these paintings and uh, has right. become a great celebrity. And his paintings are selling for millions and millions. He died around age 28, drugs, you know, but uh, really brilliant. Um, artists and um, um yeah i covered him so uh, let's, how, let's... how old is this this artist uh, this one basquiat yeah, yeah. He's dead. He, de he died around the age of 28 oh okay that's who you're talking about yeah, yeah. so i'm just saying just a reminder of him because i think the artists we're going to look at the persian artist um i think must have been influenced by him okay uh, yeah. so this is a this is a persian artist uh and I just think it's, I mean, can you see the influence? Uh, his name is Mohammed Arie, uh, contemporary Iranian artist. Very wild. And I think he's taking Persian themes, Iranian themes, mythology, and just uh, <laughs> <laughs> wild, contemporary. Style. He's <laughs> taken the entire cosmos. I just... yeah, like it's, it's, yeah, I mean it's it's primitive in a way, and it's but it's really raw, and I like it. I like it a lot. It's just like, <laughs> national, you know, using words also. But it's, he had to be influenced by Basquiat, I'm sure. But he's like a Persian Basquiat. That's <laughs> pretty cool. Great colors. Wow. <laughs> um, demons and gods and uh, yeah. <laughs> His name is Mohammed Ariye. <laughs> mystical love, la more mystique or mystical magical love. Yeah, they're very childlike too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, look at that. I don't know what. Um, with the French lines. Ah, I love the colors. Right? Yeah. yeah, and just uh, imaginative, childlike, brilliant colors, but also excellent. You know, the, the artistic quality is really good. I, really like them. I think they're gorgeous. They're good, yeah. And I like, also, I like this Live, yeah. Living in a disturbed time, too. Yeah. And they, yeah. They, they even get into like shamanism. Like, like look at that. Oh, wow. Yeah, like getting really primitive, shamanistic. Secrets on Fourier. Africa or South America, right? And it's like, whoa. Oh. Yeah, they're really vibrant and alive and primitive. And yeah, I don't know, brilliant colors. Yeah. Is he still alive? Yeah, I think he's 31, they say, 31 years old. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Still living in Iran? Uh, well, I go back to that opening page. I'm not sure because his titles are in French. So maybe they're in French. Yeah, Le Mans. Yeah. Oh, he's drawing on the uh, uh, Persian mythology. Mm. Yeah. They're very complex, too. I mean, it's not. Yeah. And like, even like Persian carpets, he's referring to like an image like this, you know, with the borders and everything. Yeah. It's like bringing, doing, bringing all these elements of, of, um, and bringing them together in a really original way. Wow. All right, I got to write his name down. I'm going to check him out. Very striking. Yes, it's, it's Mohammed A R I Y A E I. A R I Y A E I. I Y A E I. A R I Y A E I. Mohammed. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go back to that. Um, I'm going to. Wow. Back that opening page, I can't just do it. Um, let me think. Uh, uh, there it is. It's this page because it has a lot of information. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there we are. A R I Y. Uh, let's see. 
this is at a uh, Iranian Awakening Lodge. Yeah. Um, I was shown for the first time in France. Uh, 40 acrylic works on paper and on canvas by the young Iranian artist, 35 year old Mohammed Arane. It is a, a, an ode to vital energy, appetite for life, testimony of the culture. He is, it's poor, this is poorly written in English, but he is the depositary yeah. to the woman of his lineage. <laughs> it's really, it's really, that whoever wrote this does not come out of English. Oh, indeed, his great great grandmother was part of the Awakening Lodge. I don't know what that is, 100 years ago in Iran. And she delivered her knowledge on Sufism and mysticism. Ah, Sufi. There we go. Daughters from generation to generation until today. Muhammad is the first man in his family to hold this knowledge and reveal it in his paintings. His uh -huh. works are incandescent. Um, he mixes Persian poetry, literature, human beings, and animals. He summoned the Persian poets and philosophers, Asadi, all these people, Hafez, even Shams, um, to the table beyond space and time. The surface of his work is saturated with signs and cross references from the visual arts, poetry, literature, and music. Um, and it's, let's see, do, 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 mixing Arabic text and image, fresh, intense, and luminous color. The emotions arise from the use of pure color, seen with red, blue, orange, and yellow hues, applied with freedom and casualness. Uh, um, his work is a living score composed of a farandole of exuberant color, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, so yeah, so cool, huh? What is, it? A yes, what is he painting him? Pardon? What is he painting him? What media? Oh, it uh, looks like uh, mixed media. It looks like, uh, I don't know, whether it's oil or acrylic. Some of it's on paper, some of it's on canvas. So I can't tell if it's acrylic or, meat or, or uh, acrylic. They're acrylic. Acrylic <laughs> works on paper and on canvas. So he works in acrylic. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, and this, this particular page is dars.art, B-A-R-Z dot art, uh, right slash E-N slash. I shall find him. This, so, this is gorgeous. Uh, no, oh. when she sent it to me, I went, wow. Which, yeah, oh, so, my gosh. Yeah, I know. He's really And like the it. Sufis and Sham and oh, my gosh. This guy's really talented. Yeah, but yeah. He, he's putting it all together, and it's, it's probably, some probably, stuff I know, some stuff I don't. But boy, I love it. Really original, really original. Yeah, and an original in a way like Basque Atlas. Mm -hmm. uh, but more, I think this man is more mystical, and uh, Basque absolutely was more, was more political. Well, he's getting into uh, Black history. That was his cultural traditions, and etc. Mm -hmm. And with some moral commentary, but he's drawing on a more um, spiritual traditions. This man, absolutely. Yeah. So very cool. All right, so um, uh, there is a Portuguese uh, artist, installation artist, her, her name Joana Vasconcelos. And uh, I, want her, I stumbled on her not long ago. <laughs> I like her work. Um, she was born in 71, so uh, she's what, 30, 20, early 50s. So let's watch some of these, okay? Uh, about mm -hmm. her. And. Uh, <clears throat> Up close, cooking pants. When you move away, they're actually high heels. Ah. A bunch of mirrors side by side, only to reveal a huge and whimsical mask. This is the trademark of Portuguese artist Joana Vasconcelos. Repurpose everyday life objects, giving them a new meaning with humor and social criticism. <laughs> Over 30 works of Vasconcelos are now on display in the exhibition I Am Your Mirror at Sar Havlis Contemporary Art Museum in Porto, Portugal. The art installations are both inside the galleries and in the beautiful gardens where the biggest ones were placed. I'm Your Mirror exhibition is actually a retrospective of Joanna Vasconcelos' work from 1996 until today. Sir Halbes Museum had the chance to work with Joanna in a group exhibition early in her career. Then in 2000, she designed an exclusive artwork. Then in 2000, she designed an exclusive artwork called
called Meeting Point for one of our galleries. And now this installation is one of the highlights of the show that takes us on a journey through 20 years of Joanna's career. In this journey, visitors had the chance to see some of Vasconcelos' most acknowledged works. We have some key works here, like the Valium bed and the aspirin sofa, which are the oldest pieces of this exhibition. You know what that's called? Uh, the In Valium addition. bed. <laughs> and it's made up of tab of like what the, I guess the Valium tablet packages. To the iconic works, some new pieces are on display in this exhibition, like Finisterra, I'll Be Your Mirror, and Solitaire. This seven meter tall sculpture is Vasconcelos' interpretation of a wedding ring, made out of golden wheel rims and drinking glasses. <laughs> Joanna created several pieces that instigate a reflection on women's role in the contemporary world. We have here some examples of this concept in works like Burka of 2002. <laughs> Recently, Joanna has incorporated more references to the Portuguese culture in her work, which is not present at the beginning of her career. Some of her most relevant works now propose a reflection on what Portugal is and its symbols. Symbols like the famous Bardolo Pinheiro ceramics that Joanna covers with crochet, another Portuguese specialty, or the heart of Viana do Castelo, a Portuguese signature filigree made out of plastic tableware and with Fado soundtrack. Today, Joanna Vasconcelos is one of the main contemporary artists in Portugal, and she is also acclaimed internationally as one of the most important Portuguese artists of her generation. The exhibition I Am Your Mirror premiered at Guggenheim Bilbao Museum early this year. It sits at Havles Museum until the end of June. It then goes to Kunsthal Rotterdam in the Netherlands in July. That's why I'm in. It's just like her installations are like 3D Mohammed's. <laughs> um, what do you think? Any comments? <clears throat> sense of humor, good sense of humor. It's yeah. Yeah. And again, really magistrates taking everyday objects, repetition, and then creating you know, something else in large scale, but colorful. Um, what does it mean? Time machine, making a uh, time machine. <laughs> time machine is the most perfect title ever of my shows. The idea of Time Machine has been an idea that I've been using through all my work. I somehow I try to relate to my past through to identity. Who am I? Where do I come from? Thinking about my own identity as a woman, as a Portuguese woman in this century, born in 71 in, in Paris and going live in Lisbon and being Portuguese uh, puts me in a very, not only geographic, but as a woman, puts me in a very particular situation. I need to think, who am I? Where do I come from? Why am I here? So all these questions make me travel in time. They make me think even more of being Portuguese and European. What is our culture? And to think about that and to understand the differences and our particular identities, you need to travel in time. You need to go back and think, where do you come from? Where, what are your roots? Where, what is Manchester? So every time I go to a new place, I need to travel in time and to understand the identity of this city. 
I went to the science museum to understand all the, the fabric thing, the traditional, how, uh, how this city grew and became so strong and so important in the world. You know that when I went to buy fabrics in Portugal, I said, uh, the, the, the store, the uh, shop that I go to, they said, what are you going to do now, Joanne? I said, oh, I'm going to do a show in Manchester. And the guy said, oh, we just bought some velvet from Manchester. I said, oh, yeah. Do you have Manchester fabrics here? He said, yeah, a lot. Suddenly in Portugal, I bought the fabrics from Manchester. Isn't that a time machine? Yeah. This building is a time machine between the, the, the collection, the traditional museum with the entrance and all the, the things that you should have in a museum. And then this space, which is a contemporary space, it's also itself two times you have the past and the future in the same building. And of course, when I came here, I, I felt, okay, I, I understand this because my pieces, they speak about this concept, which is how can you connect it to the past? And that's what we've done in the collection, to connect with the past. And somehow, being contemporary in the middle of all those paintings. Here, in the contemporary part of, the, of, the, of this building, of this museum, I'm bringing something from the past, too. I'm bringing some ideas of the past, like, you know, Fatima, uh, the, you know, the Virgin Mary. I'm bringing, you know, the, the car, which belongs to a... And a time which doesn't exist anymore. Even these feathers, this Marie Antoinette look is from the, the past, but I'm bringing it to the future, which is this part. So, of course, we needed something also to connect <laughs> all of this together. And then we thought, okay, I need to do something that is like, you know, the connection of all this, and that's Britannia. It was designed to connect with the architecture. And the architecture of this space is very specific. It's an industrial architecture that, and it's very strong, the iron, the glass, the connection with the outside and the inside. And all of that, I wanted to, to bring all of that together. I am in the time machine by doing this exhibition. I'm learning a different culture and I'm growing and being better for the future by being here and learning from your culture. And here you have the design collection and the crafts, so it gives you an insight of the domestic environment about the silvers, the ceramics, and that interests me a lot. And so for me to show in the design collection was also very interesting. It, I've never done before. So I was used to do, you know, classical spaces like the collection. I'm used to do contemporary spaces like this. And then, okay, site specifics like Britannia I've done also. So to do all of this together makes this show completely unique. And for me, the most complete show I've ever done because I've never done all of this at the same time. And so in a way, this show is, it has been until now an amazing experience because it allowed me to connect with different levels of culture, with different levels in time, and with different levels of, you know, contemporary past and future. How can we, in this kind of spaces, try to understand all of this and, and try to project into the future something different? That's what I tried here. <clears throat> She's brilliant. Yeah. I got one more. Three minutes. What is the impact of color on art? Well, it's one of the most powerful communicators of emotion in the artist's. I was eating because.
There's a lot of humor in her. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, I like how she, she take that, uh, what, doily art, that I guess was yeah. put on, you know, put, put things along top of the bureau or whatever she's taking it and put it, put it into a whole different context because it mm-hmm. has a very safe domestic kind of feel to it. Uh, and then she puts them on these fierce animals, you know, uh, scorpions and snakes and whatever. Uh, so just these juxtapositions, etc. She's brilliant. What imagination that woman has. And uh, you can imagine the work it must have taken to put an exhibition yeah. like that. I don't know. How much. She must have a team of people, but it's like, well, and, you know, it's, yeah, and it's bold and colorful, totally original. Yeah, I, I think she's an excellent artist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know how I stumbled on her. That's four months ago. I was, this is my... Mm. she pops up and whoa look at her gotta save her for one more. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder if they run the bowls in portugal too like they do isn't that spain pamplona they that's run spain. It. Pamplona, yeah. yeah i wonder you know it's kind of so close yeah i'm i'm just reading hemingway's novel the sun also rises and that oh gosh that um i never read it before so that features the running the bowls and towards the end of the book um, so, all right, so there you go, One, um, Portuguese artist, we don't often keep a Portuguese artist, <laughs> past or present, but she's up there. The other one I want to, um, uh, Bridget Riley, uh, British artist, does that name ring a bell to anybody? Um, she's getting up there in age, she's still alive, she was born 1931, but she, um, she was like the big name in British pop art in the 60s, 70s, um, and um, and it has influenced a number, a number of artists. So that's just, uh, so we should know all 
should know about Bridget Riley. She's a good name in modern art. Uh, here's a little introduction to her. Uh, still alive. She's up there, 90. Uh, her ge geometric paintings. You'll see. You'll, you'll, you'll see them. Um, and they're a uh, lot. It's like she became synonymous with the op art uh, movement and which exploited optical illusions to make the two dimensional surface of painting see the move, vibrate, and sparkle. You'll see. Uh, but she was. Um, she experiments with structural units such as squares, oval stripes, and curves, and various configurations of colors to explore the physical and psychological responses to the eye. So she's she's getting at not painting objects or things, but the very process of perception, and how it, um, and how that is influenced by colors and shapes. Um, her paintings inspire textile design, psychedelic posters over the decades. But her objectives have always been to integrate what and how we see into both, both uncertainty and clarity with her paintings. Um, and she was very knowledgeable in the history of art. She was steeped in impressionism, and post impressionist features. Uh, she dissects the visual experience of the early modern masters without their reliance on figures, landscapes, or objects. Uh, she plays with figure ground relations and the interactions of color in a brilliant, I mean, really, really brilliant way. Um, so her compositions evoke feelings of tensions, repose, symmetry, asymmetry, dynamism, static, and other psychic stakes, making her paintings less about optical illusions and more about stimulating the, the, um, the viewer's imagination. When you look at them, they come to life, they move, and um, the more you look at them, the more they come, the more they come to life. You know? So it's not something the paintings you would want to just look at for five seconds and move on, because uh, they come to life. With um, and it's the interplay of of uh, geometric patterns and colors. Um, she meticulously planned her composition with preparatory drawings and collage techniques. And it was her assistants who paint the final canvases with great precision. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, it, it's, uh, and also it's grounded in some kind of utopian social vision. She views her art as inherently social act as the viewer completes the, the viewer completes the experience of the painting. This belief in the interactive art led her to resist the commercialization in her mind, the vulgarization of op art by the fashion world. Tell you a little bit about her. Um, right. So Joe, could yes. you ask people could you ask people to mute during the all right? So yeah, videos, everybody, please. Yeah, Thanks. okay, everybody, please mute your mics. Um, and I got a couple of um, this one's 10 minutes long. So, uh, patterns uh, going from light gray, white, light gray, to black, um, playing with grays. And, uh, so, then you stand in front of these and they're big often. Hard paintings like there's a way to start to move <laughs> and um, from the light. And then with the vertical uh, lines, um, they start to blend, they start to shift. And again, it's just uh, how, how the eye is perceiving colors. And how color how colors um, are not static, how colors are actually alive or not so alive, depending on the colors next to them and how they're interacting with other colors, which is true for how we perceive it, we're not conscious of it.
look at that. And is it the is it, you know, these are like the stop uh, images of where what's foreground, what's background. Uh, maybe your eye shifts between the white uh, spears and the black spears. And, uh, and I think that this one's fascinating. You know, it's, it's like a dance. To me, it starts dancing. It's like along this scene, and it's like a, a dance going on um, as the eye is processing black and white and the interplay of black and white. <clears throat>
Uh, so there is an inherent pattern in this. <clears throat>
Bridget is fulfilling her aim to make the space between the spectator and the picture plane become active. Her work often requires time for your eyes to settle into them and leave after images imprinted on your retina long after you're finished looking. And she hinted at a psychological component of the tension between composure and anxiety as things shift and change. And so, um, and in a way, she was mirroring the modern world uh, in these abstract patterns. So, um, her, you know, there's pop art and there's pop art, and I think her art had, had uh, a lot of sophistication and emotional depth that she's. Uh, and that's why she has her she didn't fade out her reputation didn't fade out she's still highly respected as an artist for uh, her ability to um this continue, continue the tradition of western art the movement towards color towards the, what is perception um letting the viewer uh finish it and also stirring and uh, invoking emotion um uh, and states of mind yeah Let's see what else I have here. I think I would go mad if I had to stay in a room full of her stuff. Really? Yes, absolutely. They they were scary to me. Okay, so that that evoked that. So it did invoke, and that was before they said it. It was invoking yeah. this anxiety yeah. in me, and I thought, yeah. oh my god, no, I got to get away from this. No. <laughs> right. I would. I wouldn't feel that way. I would. I might um, just stay with it. But anyone else? Just curious. I think art is, it depends on how a person perceives from person to person, especially mm -hmm. like when you go out yourself and you look at it very differently. Yeah, so, um, and if you're uh, creating art that where you finish it or you're interacting with it, then it's, then it's kind of built in and it's gonna be, everyone's gonna have their own experience. Um, and so and that's just understood. So, the, but it's an interactional, these paintings are interactional because they come to life, they vibrate, they move, they, uh, they shift. And uh, so there's two, there's, there's one way to view it. I think in the beginning, just let yourself go into it. I would and just let it act on me or watch what I'm experiencing. And there's that, and then the artist in me would wonder, well, how is she doing this? What's actually happening here? Just be more objective. Not like just going into the subjective experience with the paintings, and then just looking at how, what colors are, um, are she, how she using the color, the, the shifts of colors and the shifts of shapes. So, and just a technique and, and the master of it would be, yeah, I would, I would probably get into that. I was in conversation with her a little bit, I don't know watch the whole thing, but just get a sense of who she is, I don't know when this was done. Probably every painter has a long conversation with their work. And the longer that you live, of course, you know, the conversation goes on stretching far back. So it's, it's a reconnoiter. For me, I see my work differently as time goes by. I've realised, to my unbelievable delight, mm -hmm. that it communicates that my own dialogue with my work is reflected in how other people actually look at it. And of course, this to me is the most wonderful thing when I find that happening. The exhibition covers almost seven decades of production. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And there's a, a large group of drawings and paintings which were made when you were a student. Yes. At Cheltenham Ladies College, at Goldsmiths, at the Royal yes. College of Art. And I think many people will be surprised by the, the range of experimentation and the, the concentration on drawing in, in these works. Yes, yes. Could, could you say something about maybe the importance of drawing and technique for you as yes. the basis for your work? Yes. Before I started to draw, though, I started to look. I actually didn't think about being an artist at all. Well, I didn't think about art either. I thought, 
to find a, a context in which somehow I could exercise something in me, which I didn't know what it was, but it was about looking. And where to do that, it just seemed that the only place I could go was to an art school. You talked a little bit about the difference between a traditional approach which might start with a, a subject in nature and then mm. move gradually away from that. Yes. And you talked a little bit about how in a sense your, your approach now is the reverse and that your, your starting point might be formal qualities, volume, shape, composition, rhythm. Yes. And I think you say you put those through their paces. Pictorial elements are the agents you, through which you can put these things through their paces. You need something to do something with. Yes. <laughs> you, can't, you can't explore uh, without an agent. My line, I think, actually uh, is my agent, or was for a very, very long time. It can be a drawn line, as it was with drawn lines, I worked on making movement in squares. Mm -hmm and drawn lines through some of those big paintings, many of the big paintings. Mm. The curve is a curved line. It's, 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 a, it's a line which has been uh, bent in what I think is rather like the twists of a body. Mm. It takes different angles, different mm. positions. Uh, contraposto. Contraposto, mm. exactly. So, the, so, so but you need, uh, the, the pictorial elements are rightly called that. Mm. They're things that you need to build a picture with. And you know an incredible amount about uh, the history of art, but which artists started to attract your attention in the early years? In the early years, well, Matisse always did, especially with drawing, that he could draw a line and for no clear reason, it enclosed a volume. And there was no, no, no logic in this, you know, because the, the, it was not, uh, the, the, it, the, draw, the line did not seem to explain a skull, but it was something else. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was actually, I think now, of course, it was probably, it was, a perception. And Matisse made it all look so easy, the rascal. Made it look so easy, <laughs> yes, absolutely. But he, was, he never deceived me. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, one of the earliest rooms in the exhibition is called Looking at Sura. The great 19th century post-impressionist painter who many people will, uh, will know as the, the inventor of the pointillist technique of painting in dots. Yes, yes. But this is an artist who has meant a great deal to you yes, at different has. moments in your career. Yes, he has. Could, could you tell us something about what Sura has meant to you? I was struggling with um, this unwieldy thing called colour. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, I was applying it in little dabs, and these little dabs were not organised in any way. They had no internal logic, they had no raison d'etre. And the National Gallery had, for years, uh, Seurat's great painting, The Bathers, which you could see as you came up the stairs on the right-hand side through the window, and the light and, 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 and the beauty of the colour was, um, it was something I couldn't pass by. I started to copy a small landscape which had a similar diagonal across the, um, the canvas which separated the bank, river bank, from the river from the water. I worked methodically, as I thought she had, reworking this melange, and that was exactly what it was called. It's a melange, a mixture, an optical mixture. Mm -hmm. And his findings were of such enormous help to me, who was in exactly the same position down the line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Is it, would it, it be fair to say that Sura gave you um, a sense of structure and a sense of parallel to nature? Yes. Where you could see there was obviously a relationship to the experienced world, but you were creating something, sensations alongside it. A parallel universe. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was. It was that. It was the key into this, into uh, a, another world. Yes. You mentioned earlier that Sura had a a hard time, in a sense, for being seeming almost to be too scientific. Yes. And at moments in your career, people have felt it unfairly that your work is perhaps disciplined, cool, uh, very rigorous. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, of course, there is a strong element of intuition and really deeply felt emotion in what you do. Yes. I wondered if you felt some kinship in Sura, who was, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, derided for unfairly without people realising the, the tension that there is between these two. Uh, certainly, at one point in my life, in rage, <laughs> <laughs> strong feeling, uh, th think that I would, I would give this business up. Mm. Uh, hateful business of painting. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I, um, I was bitterly disappointed in myself. Mm. And I, um, I, I painted a, in fury a, a black canvas mm -hmm. uh, with what amounted to um, a sort of uh, ex very expressionist handling of black paint. I came down the next morning and looked at it mm -hmm. and I realised that uh, it was quite inexpressive of what I'd felt. Mm. It was just <laughs> a lot of black paint. Mm -hmm. it, it said nothing. Mm -hmm. It conveyed nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, and I thought, now what is wrong with it? Why has it failed? Um, um, it hasn't had an opposition. It, nothing has opposed it. Mm -hmm. It let it was let to run mm -hmm. like a flood of feeling, and it meant nothing. But if it had been opposed, this would, uh, so it was black, so it needed white. Um, and just at the opposite of these marks was a straight line. Mm -hmm. So I drew a straight line, the opposite of the straight line was a curved line. And, and that brought the thing together. Huge emotion, yes. huge passion. Yes. But now very much channeled and controlled and uh, to become all the more powerful. The need for an objective distance, holding something at a distance so that you can see it better, so that you can in fact become closer, mm. is, a, is, 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 is a discipline that um, uh, I've welcomed, mm. need, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a tool and also some failures which I had, I realised many years later that I suddenly could find a way of dealing with it. Mm. And that was true for measure with measure. And that problem of the integral nature of a circle, uh, the fact you can't really break it. Measure for measure paintings, the viewer, you, me, when I'm working, uh, I explore possible glances that you may have, you may pick up this diagonal, that diagonal, another one. As you see one, another one co comes up to replace it. So like your own looking, it moves. Yeah. It doesn't move, it's absolutely still. But you, by looking, you, you move it. Hmm. Putting yourself now into the position of uh, a viewer, mm -hmm. As you look at the exhibition, were there uh, any surprises for you? All of them appear slightly different because, uh, I have, A, I haven't seen them for quite a long time, mm. many of them for mm. many, many, many years, mm. and I am a different person yes. uh, now. And different experiences of looking, different current preoccupations, mm. and uh, they are the same, but then because of the fact that I am looking at them, they are different also. <laughs> so this, which is 
the amazing thing of, 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 of perception itself in action. Right. Any comments on anything she said or paintings or work uh, before we move on? I, I loved listening to her. Yeah. Uh, just uh, a great, great feeling of someone that I'd like to visit. Right, so there's definitely a name to know in modern art. Uh, big influence, well respected to this day. It wasn't just pop, 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 pop just went to the side. She's her um, influence and uh, body work is greatly respected, has influenced many uh, contemporary artists. And, and you can see she's very thoughtful. Uh, it's not just surface flashy stuff. She's getting at some pretty deep uh, philosophical issues around perception. What is perception? Alice Huxley was, you know, that this was all coming into uh, the forefront with the 20th century um, perception itself. And then also color as conveying of emotions and how, um, so, um, and then when, but then uh, abstract painting often seems random expression as she was getting that, but this is very methodical, you know, very thought out, very precise, but at the same time can get at very deep emotion and evoke deep emotion and, and psychological states. So, um, yeah, so she's, she's brilliant in that way. And, and deeply grounded in Western art, apparently world art. Uh, so, and I've been able to articulate her influences. Um, and this, this is subtle interplays of color. I mean, if you were to, um, to stay with it, uh, the black and white sort of color, you'd see it's really, um, <clears throat> Masterful, I would say, yeah, masterful. And just, and then she even said it, stripping it down to what are the essential elements of a painting, you know, composition, line, movement, uh, uh, color, how color influences are. These are like the, uh, every painting is an has these abstract uh, substructures that every artist um, relies on and draws on. So, but we can get, as a viewer, we just get, oh, that, what's the, if it's realistic, you know, what's the subject matter and what's the story of the painting? And and not even and miss all that, or not even be interested in all that. So, uh, but so modern art uh, has, in various ways, has brought the underlying structures of painting, which I just said, into the fore and made that the subject matter. And and people, uh, artists have done it in different ways with different degrees of success. So, all right. Um, and the last one. Let's see. We have to end right at four. This is um, uh, fifty-four minutes. We may get it all in. If not, we'll pick up on it. Uh, German, he's uh, he's still alive, and Selm Kiefer. I, I covered the two big German contemporary painters um, of the um, in the last 30, 40 years. Or, or Gerard Richter, we looked at him. He's using those big uh, uh, flat um, uh, boards to move paint around. I don't know if you remember Gerard Richter. We did cover him a couple months ago. And then the other one, uh, his contemporary is Anselm Kiefer. Uh, so we'll look at him. Uh, let's see, let's first of all do look at this a little bit of information about him. Uh, 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 I do my, oh, my shirt there. Yeah. Uh, German painter, sculptor, photographer, installation artist. Um, Monumental, often con confrontational campuses were groundbreaking at a time when painting was considered all but dead as a medium. He's known for his subject matter dealing with German history and myth, particularly as it relates to the Holocaust. His work forced his contemporaries to deal with Germany's past in an era when acknowledgement of Nazism was taboo. Uh, he's, he incorporates heavy and pasta, and I've been in front of some of say or so thick, and uncommon materials in those pieces, such as lead, glass shard, dried flowers, and strands of hay many of which reference various aspects of history and myth, German and otherwise, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, Kiefer is considered part of the neo-expressionist movement, which diverged from minimalism and abstraction developed new representational symbolic framework. Uh, he's a history painter in the sense, in the traditional sense, art, his art often deals with themes related to German history and national identity, including Norse legend, what Wagnerian opera, the Holocaust. Um, okay. His repertoire of imagery is wide ranging incorporating representational and symbolic motifs, including signals, occult icons, architectural interiors, landscape elements, 
to provoke an emotional and psychological effect on the viewers. Many of these make direct reference to uh, Germany's past in the forest and evoke famous battles or fairy, fairy tales of the Green Brothers. Um, he's drawn the various and often unusual media for their symbolic potency. Natural materials such as straw, earth, and tree roots reference both time and patterns of life, death, and decay. Lead also has reference resonance for the artist as a medium and subject matter. It's yeah. the base material used in alchemy, and he considers it the only material heavy enough to bear the burden of history. Uh, it has a great interest in knowledge and mythology, history. Now, uh, he often uses books as subject matter representing knowledge and civilization. He frequently incorporates texts into his paintings, uh, including excerpts from poems, novels, and nationalist slogans, as well as names of seminal figures. So, you know, um, uh, there's a little his work. Yeah. So it's 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 rich. It's dark. It jumps out at you. It's thick. It's like a. Uh, um, um, not usually, as I recall, not colorful. Playing with um, playing with a lot of dark tones and colors and fabrics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, all right. So, with just that little brief um, intro, there's a 54-minute documentary. That really, I like. Yeah, I like Joe. Yes, Joe. I wanted to share something brief because of our time thing. But it, it's a very brief quote by uh, Brabazon, and it has about art. Mm -hmm. Love of God and knowledge of truth have always been spread through art, never by evangelism. Evangelism is message minus beauty of form, and so is no message. God, man, is beauty itself. Great. That's a nice point. Thank you. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, boy, I don't know if I'll, I, I have to end like two minutes before it four, so I'm, I may, we may not quite get to the end of this one, but. Okay. Talk about thick and fast though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you use your uh, mic? Very much. I painted a long time on this painting and I did layers on layers and layers and now I go back to the beginning. You know, it's like in the cosmos, it's always construction, demolition, reconstruction, all the stars who die and some others are, are born. It's, it's always like this. Who, who is responsible for that? Who, who, who started this in the beginning? We don't know. We don't know why we are here. We don't know where we go. It's quite desperate, no? Because we have an intellect to, to try to find out, but we cannot. When, when a star explodes, all the material goes in the cosmos. It's there. It's not, for, it's not uh, God doesn't forget it, you know? <laughs> and then one day it will be recomposed. It will be, the gravity will recompose another star and so on. So I keep it all. I put it in one of the, of the boxes there, you know? If you come, you can see here uh, different
Kiefer is emphatically one of the most significant artists currently working in the world. Within the art world, Kiefer's a giant, really. There are some people whose creativity verges on the demonic, and, and he's one of those. When I was a child, I did tunnels in the garden of my parents, and and then I I, I wrote something on a, on a, made a drawing on a, on a piece of paper. I put it in the tunnel and I closed it. I thought thought you know why you do this? It it, it must be um, a deep need to do things like that. I'm thinking of when you were born, 1945, and obviously that moment in the history of Germany. When I was a child, the neighbor house was a ruin, and another it was a ruin around. And, and this ruin. was your playground? Yes, it, it, I had nothing else. I played with these bricks in the ruins of, the, of Donner Esching, you know. There was a mass of them. I could play with them. As a young artist, Anselm Kiefer prodded incessantly at the open wound of German history. His paintings from that time are covered with references to mythical German heroes. Siegfried, Hermann, Parsifal, blood-soaked legends of the deep past. These are the same heroes around whom the Nazis built a cult. This made critics uneasy and led to outrage when he represented Germany at the Venice Biennale, with some accusing him of fascism. Was he trying to redeem these German heroes and wash away their sins? If people say, oh, who has made this? Is this, is this a neo-Nazi? Then, um, then I say nothing because I go back to an earlier time, in which time I don't know what I was. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's not clear what I was in 30 or in 39. It's not clear what happens with me in this time. And most of the intellectuals, they don't ask this question, what they would have done or, or what they feel, really. Kiefer's first flush of success came in the 1980s, and he used the money to buy and renovate an old brick factory in Buchen, Germany. He 
Here, he expanded into sculpture and installation. He began to create a world for himself. I've come to Buchen to see this first studio for myself and to watch Kiefer install some new work. I think we have to go over, over there. Yes, we go up here. Careful to your head. This was for an airplane, but I didn't continue it. It looks awkward. When I did the straw paintings yes. in, the, in the 80s, then I had a, sometimes an X, and I took the straw away. Yeah. When it was too much, or when I wanted it, uh, just the remnants of straw in the painting. Yeah. And then uh, I didn't throw it away, and I, I brought it here, I thought. That's probably been here for how many years? When did you do the straw oh, That's here for, for, from since 80, 84. So it's been here for about... 30 years now. <clears throat> 30 years, yeah. Well, it's, it doesn't transform. It survived very, very well. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Do you throw anything away? No, no, never. Never anything. I think it all can be reused or transformed. It was here in Buchen that Kiefer's work began to develop in new directions. As he plunged deeper into the guilt and horror of German history, it was as though somehow conventional paint was no longer enough. He began to mix it with ash, earth and straw, the debris of the world. These two paintings are Kiefer's response to Death Fugue, a poem about the Holocaust by the Jewish poet Paul Salam. Schwarze Milch der Frühe, wir trinken dich nachts. Wir trinken dich mittags und morgens. Wir trinken dich abends. Wir trinken und trinken. Ein Mann wohnt im Haus. Dein goldenes Haar, Margarete. Dein aschenes Haar, Schülemit. If the horror of the world mm. can be expressed by artists, then that is an achievement, isn't it? Um, the, word, the word achievement is very difficult. It's um, as horrible the subject is, art becomes beauty. That's, that's a malediction, even. A curse. It's, it's a, a curse. <laughs> that all becomes beauty, you know? But um, it doesn't mean that you have found the sense of the world. You have, you have constructed a sense. You could be seduced to think that art could redeem the world. It cannot. You yeah. see, there, there, there are the ovens, doors, the brick ovens. The brick ovens. This is really, for me, very shocking, this. And I never changed anything. I just put a bulb in because this is already, I cannot do it that better, you know? Mm. Um, it's like it is, you know? But of course, without saying it, this is sure. very troubling when you yes. look at it. It's for this reason, I never did something in here. It's already enough. Yeah. Dein goldenes Haar, Margarete. Dein aschenes Haar, schülle mit. Julien, ça va? The reason Kiefer has returned to Buchen with his assistants is to install these new works. Here are those occupations photographs again, now reused and transformed, just like the straw. They'd been blown up on giant sheets of lead. In the 60s, I 
couldn't do them because they had not the money to big, big exposures. So there was a lot of potentiality left. <laughs> History is a material. It's like clay, you know, you can form it as you want it. You can abuse it, you know, this form. What they all do. Since the 1990s, Kiefer's artistic vision has, like the cosmos, expanded. He began to attach objects to his canvases, plants, lead books, the weapons of war. Each object has a deeper meaning, an allusion to one of Kiefer's wildly diverse interests. There are references to ancient civilizations, to occult 17th century philosophers, or to NASA's attempts to organize the stars. If they could be said to share a common theme, it is man's quest to make sense of the world. Are you a believer? I believe not in a personal God who will help me or condemn me or <laughs> put me in the, in the hell. Um, I, but it's, it's evident that there, there is something above us, far above us, who, what we cannot understand. More and more you, you ask yourself why we are here and for what reason. Nobody knows it. So for this reason you are always we're always looking, uh, searching. looking, searching for something. In 1992, Kiefer moved his studio to Barjac in the south of France. Without the help of architects or engineers, Kiefer and his assistants have turned this 200-acre site into one of the most dazzling, jaw-dropping works of art in the world. There are tunnels, towers, and pavilions to house his installations. It is Kiefer's imagination writ large on the landscape. They're great, isn't it? <laughs> now you can look through, Elektra. Look. Very here, you have so, so, so long feet uh, from here. Warum machst du zwei auf einmal? Eins reicht! Elektra, bist du verrückt? Was gut? Da habe ich so lange gearbeitet hier, zu lange. Ach, ja, 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 mein Schatz, ja, mein Schatz. Ich habe ein, hier ein, ein Lotro. Oui, oui. Tony, wir können es tourner, um zu sehen, ob es gut ist. Lotro ist nicht groß. Lotro ist nicht groß? So how would you describe Barjac? Is it a working studio or an exhibition space or what? 
It almost feels like a laboratory. I would say laboratory is a good word, yes. Exhibition space, laboratory, and uh, it's a work of art who, who has different um, issues or different material. You know, it's landscape, it's, it's um, minimal art, it's conception art, it's, it's land, land art, it's all this together. It is an overwhelming place to walk around, and normally it's off limits to the public. But one month from now, Kiefer is inviting a select group of curators and collectors here for the very first time. And there's work to be done. Nehmt mal den Scheiß da weg. Hopp, dann nicht. Hopp. Ah. Ah. Tony, il faut dire à Alain qu'on met l'avion que le nez va vers l'ouest. <laughs> Tony, l'ouest. Vers l'ouest, donc vers là. Oui. Ok. Tony. Voilà. <laughs> So I started with three containers. I put them and I put around other containers and then in the, in the, in the um, space between, I put concrete, I just put concrete. And here you can see the container is still visible. It was an inner container and the container was outside, I took the bay and I had a wall. So I started here, I wanted just to have three uh, places underneath the earth and like bunkers or so. And then I thought it's so nice and I continued with the next and the next and the next. So it's, it, it was just growing, growing like a painting, you know. I like things in movement. I don't li like them static. I like them that they move and that they surprise me. If this will collapse, it would be a wonderful surprise, you know. I wanted that it, it that it slides a little bit, you know, because you can imagine when it would slide a little bit, it would have been wonderful, you know, but it didn't. Didn't. Didn't want. I get a cigar now. I was a long time, I had a problem. I didn't know if I would be a writer or a, a painter. Now I cannot change anymore. It's done now. It is a printing machine. They are filled up for centuries with meanings, you know, it's enormous. And, um, yeah. And I transform them now in a new meaning. tradition, the letters are sacrosanct. However you combine them, even in a completely irrational way, it, it makes a sense, you know, because the letters themselves are holy. Tony, le, le plancher sur, le, sur la crypte, c'est fait maintenant ou pas encore Non, non, euh, je vais vous faire voir ce qu'on est en train de faire sur la crypte. D'abord, on renforce les piliers en bas. Montez-moi, montez-moi.
these pillars are made with a drill. So there was nothing, we drilled, and then in this hole, in this hole, in this hole we put the concrete. These are the pillars then. Ah, c'est joli, Tony, c'est joli. Ah, c'est tout joli, Tony. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire, Tony Ça, il y a bien de plus en plus. Alors, here I, I left a hole because I like to come to Earth in a room, you know. It's wonderful, no? Tony, c'est beau, ça. C'est bon, fa fantastique. Ça, je n'ai rien fait en attendant que je savais que vous alliez venir. Parce que si on ne fait rien, c'est toujours beau, Tony. Il n'y a que vous qui pouvez décider si c'est bon, celle -là. <rire> Ni moi, n'est pas décidé. <rire> Regardez cette lumière, Tony. Il faut faire quelque chose. C'est joli, non, cette lumière. Dit, Tony, this has to be done quickly, because I want it to okay, so stay like this. We go, up we, go, we go up How we can go up uh, here? The best will be by, by here. Tony, this was the first to then. Yeah, right. It's so awkward, no? <laughs> <laughs> we can do something like this, Anselm. You should not touch below, Tony. No. Tony it stays like this. No, I below. Know. Maybe you will get a little bit more stones when we are going to work on it. But, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it, huh? Oh, Tony. You like scale, don't you? I know scale, you, you're yeah. in denial about it. Is it important to you, scale? No, I, you know, I don't look at it like you look. It's my, it's my gesture. So, so it's, it's my body who is implicated. You know the quotation of Nietzsche, the uh, philosopher has to dance. It has to be, you have to dance. So, so it's, it's the physical part. It's very obvious, and, and the scale is a product of the, of the dance, if you want, you know. And what I see in your work it makes me look at the world differently. Your use of material, whether it's lead or it's straw, material which ages and changes and transforms. I think the transformation is, is in them. Because, for example, since a few years, some years, I do um, electrolyzes. I put the painting in an electrolyzed bath. You know, I want to put some time on this painting. I want to accelerate the time. And um, this is what the alchemists do. What happens in nature, they accelerate. My paintings go on very often to change. They get green or red or with the time. I think you can see beauty in anything. I remember I was walking once on the beach in India and um, the people came in the morning to the sea to shit, you know? A lot, a lot, thousands, you know? It was covered with shit, you know? And, and it was fantastic, you know? You could see all colors. You, it's a palette of colors. No, there are no, there are no ugly things. When you look at films, uh, Germany after May 45, you know, it looks so fantastic, these, these damaged uh, towns, you know. And I mean, each artist, uh, each writer, he, his uh, capital is a childhood, you know. 
all what you what you learned there, what you saw there, because you saw there without any connotations. You saw it like innocently. Innocently, and that's important. Yeah. All the source of inspiration, the source of doing something, is there. You know, when you are a child, you have little, little, uh, little equipment, and, and now I have real ones. It's, but it's the same, you know. It, it's not, it's not so much different. Achtung! Noch ein bisschen drehen. So, und jetzt höher. Bisschen höher, bisschen höher, Tony, bisschen höher. C'est joli. Quand même, c'est un naufrage. <rire> Regardez, Alain le dirige par sa volonté. Levez, levez, levez. Hop, 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 hop. Hop. Ça plie. On peut plus de ferraille là, comme ça on peut l'appeler au plus près. Non mais, mais c'est beau comme ça, on va, on va l'agrandir avec du plan. Alain, c'est lui, il fait la prolongation de, de l'aile. Non, c'est plus le plan. Hein Hein, Jack, Jack. Vous dormez la nuit Ah oui, ça, ça, oui. Mais, ah, oui. mais Alain, vous n'êtes pas encore en retraite, non oh, Pas loin. Moi, je ne dors pas la nuit. Ah bah oui, mais moi aussi. Vous êtes plus en santé que moi. Ah oui, je dors. This was less good. Oh! Qu'est-ce qu'il fait là? Alain, ne cassez pas ma ma serre. You are genius. Yeah. You are quite genius. No, 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 I like this machine. Yeah! Now I have to guard against order sometimes. So because there's always a middle way or a compromise between chaos and order. If it's too chaotic, nothing comes out, you know? If it's too order, it's sterilized, you know? So you have to always find the way between these two things. Let's go. Stop! Stop! You try to get the most English to get but then you don't correct it. When it's in a fall, it's like this. This big thing hurts me Now it gets better. Yeah, 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 yeah.
Sunflowers are everywhere in Kiefer's universe. He seems to prefer them dead and dried up when their heads are packed with seeds, a potent symbol of death and rebirth. Mm -hmm. Six years ago, Kiefer moved his studio for a third time. He now works here, on an industrial estate half an hour east of Paris, in a warehouse that used to belong to a department store. Unlike Barjac, everything here is on one level. Paintings and sculptures can be moved quickly on wheels. In fact, everyone who works here uses bicycles to get around. There's a, um, somebody, I can't tell if it's in the video or someone's mic is on. So it sounds like someone's mic is on because I just stopped the video. So please meet your mics. I think it's in the video. Everybody's mic is off. All right. Yeah. You know, this, what you see here, is, is like my brain. It's uh, all the synapses and things. And I go around and uh, sometimes I find late a new connection <laughs> between some objects, between a painting and an object, or between two paintings and so on. Obviously, you've collected these things. Yeah. Oh, there are a lot of things. There are skins of snakes. There are rails out of clay or locomotives, uh, flowers, uh, all kinds of plants, debris, all kinds of things. So you have your memories and your materials, but also you might want to come back to these works at any time. So they're all here for you to... They're waiting. I think to wait is something important. It's philosophical to wait, no? You know, today people don't wait anymore. You are always in contact with your friend, with your wife, you, you have always your, your handy with you, and oh, now I'm there, now I'm here. It's, it's no more waiting for someone. Some of these works have been waiting for a very, very long time. I think they are works from 71, I think. In the containers outside, I have works from the earlier 70s. But I know where they are in which container. And then I go with my bicycle through all these uh, rooms, all these spaces, and then I have an idea.
Vous j'ai fait une ligne suivant les des montagnes, tu sais, avec le l'or. Tu auras peut-être aussi. Ah, tu sais que je fais, je fais une ligne d'or dans le, dans, le, dans le vêtement. Je crois que ça, ah oui, ça, 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 pas ça suffit. Mmh. Parce que le vêtement est beau, les couleurs sont parfaites. Le... Oui, oui, oui. Mmh. Non, non, je fais une ligne d'or. Mmh. Et puis ça sera bien. Après, on a les trois éléments l'or, le plan mmh. et l'argent. Là, il faut mettre en or. Do you enjoy the process of making? Um, it's difficult and, and sometimes it's a failure. Because in any state of, of a painting, you have 100 possibilities and you have to choose one. It's a war in your head, you know? And when I look two, three days later, I think it's shit, you know? It happens, you know? Because you, you are in a certain situation, you think, ah, oh, now I got something, you know? And then you have to wait to calm down, you know? And then you see. <laughs> and sometimes the contrary happens too. You, you think, oh, I, I worked so much and, and now I, I, it's damaged, it's, it's, it's not good. And, uh, and then later you see, oh, you fa found a new thing. How do you know when a work is ready to leave the studio? It's a very difficult moment uh, <coughs> because um, it's an artificial interruption. It's a crucial moment when I have to give a painting to a show and, and, and they sell it and, and it's <laughs> I cannot touch it anymore because uh, then the curators or restaurators are take over and it's taboo for me. You should divide one in two and then... <laughs> it's too much, Bill. We cannot use these walls. Can we just a bit more rüberschieben? Maybe it's better. This gets out for the moment, okay? You will take it out. Okay. You know how he used to show me the paintings? There were the paintings. There was a frame with wheels. And the paintings were outside. So one day it was raining and he wanted to show me paintings on wheels. And I said, Anselm, maybe we should wait until it uh, doesn't rain. He said, rain won't hurt it. It might even help it. <laughs> and so he would bring the paintings out 
and leave them out in the rain while we're looking at them and then put them all back. So that's what's so great about working with him. Herr Karl, können Sie das mal rausnehmen? Aber noch greifbar, weil wir sind noch nicht ganz sicher, ne? Yeah. Oh, it looks already better, Bill. Yeah. I did some flower paintings. I like so much flowers, you know. And then I thought, that's difficult to do flowers, you know. That's too, it's too uh, comforting. People would like it too much, you know. I thought I have to give the flowers and the fields of, of wonderful fields of flowers another meaning. And I called it Morgenthau plan. Henry Morgenthau, Jr. was an American politician who in 1944, with victory imminent, devised a plan for Germany after the war. He wanted to destroy its factories and turn the entire country into farmland. The Nazis discovered this, and Goebbels seized the opportunity to inspire the German people to fight on. We have ja in the last years die Feindpläne zur Genüge kennengelernt, den Plan des Juden Morgenthau, dass 80 Millionen Deutschen ihre Industrie beraubt würden und Deutschland zu einem Kart einzigen Kartoffelfeld gemacht werde. Ich bin nun hier vor Ihnen erschienen, um einerseits als Vertreter des Volkes vor der Nation und vor der ganzen Welt zu erklären, dass wir dieses Gebiet niemals aufgeben werden und es verteidigen werden wie eine Festung bis zum letzten Atemzug. So the Morgenthauer plan didn't happen, but I like this idea of, the, of, of this not executed plan. And I think an artist has a good opportunity to do something with it, because it didn't happen, you know? I, I had in my head the idea, Germany would bloom everywhere, there would be a lot of flowers, wheat everywhere, and it would be a wonderful green country. Now we go here. Because in the middle it could be uh, more, how do you say, more dis disparate. Aber Andreas, zuerst die Kleinen reinmachen, ja. das könnt, könnt ihr die nachher nicht mehr. Erst die Kleinen alle reinmachen. Was ist mit dir los? You know, you do exhibitions, you, you sell paintings, and, and once you have to say, that's not finished. But you, you, you're very reluctant to say anything is finished. Yes, I think it's, it's never finished. Even when, when it left my studio, it, it continues, because um, the, the feeling of the spectators play a big role, because they create then thousands and millions of of their own picture of the picture. You get a feeling now that here's a man at the height of his creative powers. I mean, he always had energy, but I've just seen a level of intensity in the last 10 years escalate. And I think it's going to be a, you know, a, a phenomenal late period. Maturity, I think we call it. Okay. The Erdzeitalter. Do you know what it is in, in no. English? Uh, stratigraphy, strat of the time. Yeah, for example, you can see a portrait here. Yes. You see these flowers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Queen of France, you see. <laughs> she doesn't look too pleased, Anton. <laughs> what is this? I don't think there's ever been anything like this quite in the Royal Academy. Look, look around <laughs> you, you know, this is... Uh, did you spend much time establishing this in the no. cell? No. Uh, four and a half hours. Wow. It goes quick. I have, you know, five people, 
and they throw it. <laughs> I made it from this side, you know? Yeah. But it's always better from the other side. Yeah. Did you, did you, you was aware of this? You, it's controlled from this side, from the yeah. other side not. Uh -huh. And that's mostly better. And in this room, you, you want some in your camera. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you just for the sake of time, unfortunately, there's only six minutes to go, but um, I'm going to save it right up to the last second. So, hold on, I'm going to stop the screen share. Stop the recording. Well, we're going. All right, so, um, yeah. <laughs> Any comments at all? Start with Mike's. Just curious what you think of him. <laughs> There is a lot I have to say, but I have to figure it out how to say it. It, uh, it connects to me very much to my living in Germany after the war and not realizing what it was all about until mm -hmm. much later. And my horrendous anger at myself that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think he is my contemporary Vincent and Edvard. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> too close. Too close. All right. Thanks. Anyone else? I I just have to say I have some German genes, and you know it was. I I was not all that interested. I do feel he he doesn't believe in a personal God. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't, uh, you know, I, I, I had opposition to it. It's, oh my God. It's art. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um. Anyone else? I think that's interesting. We bring ourselves to art. So an artist isn't talking the same way to any of us, I guess. Well, it's like life, the same as life. We bring exactly, our... yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, he strikes me as a seeker. He's at a certain stage of his uh, absolutely psychological spiritual evolution. He's he seemed to say, yeah, he doesn't believe in a conventional religious God, but uh, he's seeking through his work. So his he's a he, he's a philosopher, he's a thinker. That's what I got. So he may have not yes. arrived. That's interesting, some, interesting. Uh, certainly, Hit, Hitler was an art student too. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I loved it. I was so inspired, and it blew my yes. mind. I would love. I mean, if he's alive, I would love to meet him and go there and see it myself, and maybe walk, you know, like <laughs> intone under him or something like that. It is just mind blowing. I have never seen, heard anything like this in my whole life Great. so i'm so <laughs> he's still alive who is that yeah mm -hmm. it, it's, he's one, most, he's one of the most financial successful uh financially at least uh artists in the world you can see right. the amount of money he's spending on these things so he's a yeah. multi multi multi-millionaire from the sale yeah. uh, if, if you look at the history uh, of art uh, if you look at uh, Vincent Van Gogh, Picasso, they all were great artists, but they were recognized a lot after they were no more. But he was right. a living artist. Uh, Picasso was. Picasso was one artist, and yeah. he's doing so much. You know, I mean, they're all great artists, but they had their own struggle with money and life and relationships and everything, you know? And the recognition that they have today that kind of recognition they didn't have when they were alive. So oh. this this artist is alive and he is doing things. I mean, he's doing so much that the world needs to see, know, hear, feel, experience. You know, I, I, can you please send me the link to on, um, on YouTube and sell and sell Kiefer documentary? It'll pop up. And sell Kiefer documentary. It's a little show. How do you uh, other words. But, uh, you know, he grew up in at the at post-war Germany. He grew up in the ruins, playing with the ruins. So uh, his sense of beauty is different than his experience is different. And he sees beauty okay. in everything. He sees beauty in, in destroyed buildings. He said it. He said it's not our conventional sense of nice, nice beauty. 
Mm -hmm. he, but, so he's incorporating destruction and decay and um, into a totality of that is beautiful too. He said it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's not, it's like the Kali aspect of, you know, the preserver, greater dis preserver and destroyer. And so there's the destructive phase of everything where, where, where it's beautiful, you know, decay and mold and all, and, and aging and buildings and objects mm -hmm. <laughs> and random, random messes that he creates have, um, have, what he's saying is, um, our, yeah, it's our sense of beauty is, he's challenging it and everything he does is a challenge sense. And he's a, he's a child. He's, he's, he's still playing in the ruins like he was with the mm -hmm. five-year-olds. Now he's a multi-zillionaire and he can play mm -hmm. at his massive scales. And uh, so Picasso himself said it was, he never became an artist for real until he connected to his, his child state. And, and that's what he's done in his own way, his own unique way, because of his own personal experiences. Uh, so he's just playing. These are all playgrounds, yeah. like, all right? And it's remarkable. And yeah, he's brought his, his limited, he's into grays and dark colors, uh, very muted colors, mm -hmm. okay? And that's a challenge. We like bright, that like Joanne, the other artists, you know? But uh, look at what he, there's, it, it's, it's something we would dismiss as that's ugly. Uh, I don't, you know, um, concrete, blood, blood. Even, even he said piles of, of defecation, he found beautiful. <laughs> All right, so good. So uh, that's what artists Great. That's what artists do. They challenge us yes. to, to, that, to, uh, in, to look at how we judge the world, what's, what's uh, beautiful, what's not, what is acceptable, what's not. Do we, um, um, so even challenging you, uh, Rosalie, he doesn't, he's, I don't like his work because he's, he doesn't believe in a personal God. Uh, okay, that's- I mean, that was just one thing I heard, but I wow, personally that, did not like makes, the work. No, but- And that, that, everyone is entitled to yeah. have a response. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and I'm responding, part, I'm part responding, of yeah. Part of our appreciation is to look at how we, um, and to expand our, um, be aware of our, of our judgments and to expand uh, our repertoire of what um, is art and what is beauty. That's I think what, is, what art appreciation does. And uh, yes. yeah, so oh, what time we got here? Four o'clock, gotta end, sorry. Okay, see you oh. next two weeks. Okay. I, lo I look forward to Christ and okay, see you Thursday. Kashmir. yeah. <laughs> Me too, bye bye Joe. <laughs> uh, 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 bye bye. <laughs> We left and had two questions. <laughs> uh, any idea when uh, the Christ uh, documentary is going to be showing? Because I know two other Baba lovers who would love to see it. And I didn't really catch the name of this artist he was showing. Can you put it on chat for me? He's gone. I think he's gone. It's supposed yes. to be the same time, four o'clock on Thursday. Yeah. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Our Eastern time. One, yeah. two, three, four. Four o'clock American yeah. Eastern time. And this latest artist's name is Ansel. I think it's A N S C L Kiefer. K I E F E R. Is that what you wanted to know? Oh, that's Mona talking yeah, from can Bombay. You put, can you put it on chat for me? I'm too dumb. <laughs> okay, just wait. Know. Can you just hang on a second and just uh, repeat that slowly for me? Thank you. Yes. Ready? Yeah. Okay, the artist, A-N-S-E-L. And Phil. Yeah. K-I-E-F-E-R. K I E F E R. Okay. And Stel Kiefer. And Kiefer. the thing Joe is going to do on Thursday will be at four o'clock my time, which is Eastern the United States. So I don't know what. Four yeah, o'clock. Okay. As long as I have one time that I can give it to the uh, two people. I think Armel was interested from Paris and Jackie. Oh, that's wonderful. The beach. Yeah. So they, yes. uh, they're looking for me to get back to them on that. 
Thank yes. you so much. Uh, it's, it's, Thank on, you. it's on the schedule. It's on the schedule. Yeah, but Yeah, Jackie, and he already announced it was going to be on Thursday. Yeah. Anyway. You know, because we are on this group, but they don't come on this group. No, yeah. it's right. on the, right. the schedule. I know. Was me. I told them to check the schedule, but yeah. I, I thought it's this week, right? It is. It's, it it is in two days or three days it from is now. This week. Yeah. Yes. Thursday of this week. Yeah. Yeah. In three I, days. I would inform them. Thank you so much. Thank you, and hope we'll see you on Thursday. Let's see if I am awake at.